you're amazing. We keep saying that, but I, you know, sometimes we struggle with that. I told somebody in the first service, it's like, Larry, you know you're amazing? He looked at me, he said, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna say it one more time and I, I don't want you to give Larry's answer, right? Do you know you're amazing? Yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I pray you receive that this morning. Friends, uh, we're gonna go into the Old Testament this morning. So if you bought your Bibles with you, we are going to go to the second book of Samuel. The prophet Samuel, the second book of Samuel. Um, if our screens work correctly, you'll see it in the New International Version on the screen. I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Version, New Revised Standard Version out of my Bible. Your Bible may read a little different, but listen for the content. Listen for the content. Um, this is King David beginning his reign as king, the former king, Saul, has died in battle. And let's read chapter 9, 2 Samuel. Then David, King David says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they, call, and, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul who I may show kindness to? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Well, where is he? And, the, and Ziba said to the king, Behold, he's in the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David, fell on his face, prostrating himself. And David said this, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. David said to him, don't fear. I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all that the land of your grandfather, Saul, um, left for you, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, Mephibosheth prostrated himself and said, What is your servant, my lord, that you would regard or notice a dead dog like me? And the king called Saul's servant Ziba, and he said to him, Listen, all that belong to Saul and to his house I've given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants will cultivate the land for him. You'll bring him the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And when Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at the David's table as one of the king's sons. I know it's been sound like I'm speaking in tongues, right? And Mephibosheth, who? All right. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. He ate at the king's table all his life. He was laying in both feet. Praise God for the reading of his word. So here we are, right? David, who was a shepherd boy, was anointed king um, by the prophet Samuel. Um, this is taking place about, well, I don't know, six or seven generations prior to the birth of Christ. And when the prophet Samuel had anointed David king, Saul was still king at the time. Mm. You know, we saw a lot of times we don't know who will succeed us until after the fact, but he knew it while he was still king, right? Yet David honored Saul, okay? 
Many times David could have taken the throne, right? Saul wasn't such a great king. David saw that, but David still honored Saul. Many times he had the opportunity to kill Saul and take the throne right then and there, but he didn't. He waited on the appointed day of the Lord. And when that day came, Saul fell on his sword and he died. Not only he died, but his son died too, who was heir to the throne. Now when the news of King Saul's death reached the king's palace, right, they boogied out of there. I mean, they started grabbing what they could. They were out of there and they fled for their safety because they knew there was going to be a new sheriff in town. And they didn't want to be around when it happened. One of the children as they were fleeing for safety was picked up by a nurse. But in her hurry, she dropped him. And he became crippled in his feet. That child was Mephibosheth. That child was the grandson of King Saul, the son of Jonathan. Friends, I remember leaving my house on an icy cold winter morning, uh, afternoon I should say, and for whatever reason, uh, my mom was with us and, and, and she, I had an infant daughter, my son was about seven at the time, and, and, and she wanted to carry Marissa. And uh, we came on out of the house, and I don't know what made me look back, but I did as we were approaching the car. And there goes my mom and my daughter down to the ground. And it was almost just graceful. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, before I knew it, they were both on the ground. But fortunately, they were both okay. Nothing happened. God just laid them both down and both of them got up just as pleasantly as they fell down, sort of. <laughs> now friends, some of us have become broken in life, not because someone intended to do us harm, right? But because life happened to us. Life happens to us. Chronic illnesses happen to us in life. Childhood accidents happen to us in life. I remember my son was riding his bicycle and, you know, those plastic things on the handlebars, right? Well, sometimes they go through and just leaves the metal exposed and, boy, he turned and fell and right through his cheek and he bears a scar to this day. Accidents happen. Motor vehicles, accidents happen. Mistakes happen. My mom didn't mean to drop my daughter, but it happened. The nurse didn't mean to drop Mephibosheth, but it happened. So imagine, though, David's initial thoughts when he learns that Jonathan's son has survived after he and his grandfather were killed in battle. Now, I want you to know there's a little bit of juxtaposition of sorts going on here. Now, now it's interesting that David wants to do something kind for the former king's family because this generally isn't the case, but that's just the kind of man that David was, and that's just the kind of love that he had in his heart for Jonathan, and that's just the kind of respect that he had for King Saul. You see, it wouldn't be any, no small news to David, right? given the common practice of the changing of the guard, so to speak. You know, during the reign uh, uh, or the changing of a king, it wouldn't be this really polite and democratic and, and dignified process that we observe on TV today. You know, when our presidents, okay, yeah, all right. There wouldn't be this wonderful, peaceful transfer of power that we have here in our country where the, where the outgoing first lady buys an incoming first lady a nice gift, where the presidents, the former and the new, shake hands for a camera shot, right? No, 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 there wouldn't be anything like that. During the reign of kings in biblical times, the setting down of one king and the raising up of another king was a matter of life and death. And in the, in the case of King Saul's death, his son Jonathan would have been heir to the throne, but he died in battle as well. And so in order for a new king to, 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 to secure his reign and his right to the throne, it would be necessary to immediately take out the enemy. Who was the enemy? The enemy would be anyone connected with the former king's household, right? It would be a son, a grandson, anyone who could claim a rightful inheritance to the throne. 
anyone who could claim that kingship. There wouldn't be any dignified, democratic way of doing that, but there would indeed be death. Subjects and servants and warriors of King Saul, on the other hand, would have suited up in their armor and they would have defended King Saul's uh, family inheritance to the throne. But God had anointed a mighty man named David and his reputation preceded him. So instead of Saul's people learning of Saul's death and suiting up in armor to come against anybody who would come and challenge the throne, right? They boogied out of there. They're like, we heard about this man named David and we don't want any parts of him. Who can stand against David's mighty warriors, right? He was a mighty man of war. He was, had a reputation. He was a killing machine. No doubt this is why they fled. They knew David would become king because God appointed it to be so. But even though God sent the prophet Samuel to anoint David as king, even though Saul despised him and even sought to kill David during his reign, um, he, Saul perceived him as a threat. Saul always saw him as a threat. You know, I don't know about you, but, but, but it's often been my experience from those who feel threatened by me or those who despise what God has called me to do to try and do everything to take me down. They disrespect you, they, they lie on you, ridicule you, say all manner of evil against you, trying to wear you down, trying to make you turn from the thing that you know that God has called you to do, from the thing that God has anointed and appointed you to do and to be. You see, they don't understand in all of their mess and all the ways they come against you that no weapon formed against God's anointed can prosper and every tongue that rises up in opposition is put to shame, it's quieted. That's the way God works. God has a way of putting a hedge of protection around us, friends. Now that hedge of protection doesn't mean that we won't suffer harm. And it doesn't mean that we won't suffer loss. It doesn't mean that we won't get attacked. And it doesn't mean that we won't make mistakes and, 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 and react to the ways that we're treated. You know, while we're waiting on God to put us where God wants us to be, sometimes we just react foolishly. Sometimes we do foolish things. Sometimes we allow ourselves to get caught up in things that we don't need to be caught up in. But when God puts a hedge of protection around your life, it absolutely means that God has purpose for your life and he's going to bring it to pass. So friends, if you're surviving right now, if you're hanging on by a thread, if you just feel a little broken this morning, I want you to know that God has purpose for your lives. Can you say amen? Amen. I remember working during my former days in state government. During election times, things would get sort of shaky, you see. I was in a director position, and, and, and if the incumbent elected official was being imposed, there would start to be all these little internal strategies that would have to get worked out, right? Have to figure out where people are going to land, right? When a new chief comes in town, it's like, where can we hide you? You know, where can we put you in the, in the, on the org chart so that you don't get found out and don't get your head chopped off, right? Because uh, the word was on, you know, the word would be, you know, heads are going to roll if we get a new elected official, right? And it's not because heads were going to roll because they didn't like you. It wasn't heads were going to roll because it, it, it's just that they had their own trusted people. They had favors that they wanted to repay. They had folks that they needed to be in their corner, out with the unknown, you know? They wanted people they could trust. I went through several of those transitions, and for whatever reason, God's hand was upon me. He purposed me to survive those transitions. So my fate was not an immediate firing. In fact, under one transition, I was actually promoted. I was asked, him, could you take the helm? And here's 10,000 extra dollars to do it. I was like, oh. And they treated me like a redheaded stepchild. I was like, oh. I mean, you ever been somewhere and somebody say, I want you to be here or whatever, but they really don't want you to be there? I was a real head scratcher. But sometimes when God has positioned us, 
and appointed us, we'll find ourselves in places that aren't really comfortable, but we're intended to be there. And I don't say that to brag, but I, I say it as a testimony, as a fact, that when God has purpose for your lives, He will preserve you despite the circumstances. Now Mephibosheth, the grandson of the former king, should have been murdered, friends. He was a prince. He was an heir to the throne. Many of David's warriors had already fiercely pursued and uh, annihilated those who were thought to be a threat to David's kingdom. Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, next in line for the throne, should have been, I'm not saying because I wanted him dead, but I'm saying the way things work, should have been the first to go. So how is it 15 years had passed now, right? And Mephibosheth is still alive. He's not only alive, but he's somewhat thriving. He has a wife and he has a child. How is it that David's army left this known threat untouched? I mean, it's not like they didn't know where Mephibosheth lived, right? <laughs> when David asked, is there anyone uh, from the household of Saul that I can show kindness to? It's not like they had to do a worldwide search for the man called Mephibosheth, right? I want a name like that. You ain't got to say it but once. It's like Alethea. Anybody know Alethea? It's like, oh yeah, because that's not a very familiar name, right? They knew exactly where he was. Mephibosheth was living in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar was known as a desert place, friends. It was a place where, let's just say, was no cell service, right? It was a place like uh, where you had to pipe in the sunlight, if you will. There was no word, no communication that came from or went to Lodabar. In other words, Mephibosheth, he was living in exile. Remember, he had to flee. His nurses took him and flee. They went to Lodabar, a place where nobody would come looking for him, right? A place, a desert place, there's no pasture. Went to a place where no one would know him as prince. How is it he was still alive? Well, you know, maybe they got word that, 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 that Mephibosheth was crippled. So they just wrote him off. They just wrote him off as zero threat. <laughs> you know, the truth is, in those days, those who were lame or crippled or deformed or had other kinds of maladies, they were just written off. Have you ever just felt written off because you got some stuff going on in your life, right? Because somebody dropped you, dropped you off. Because some unintended harm happened to you, you just got wrote off. Wrote off from the job interview, nah. Wrote off from participate, eh, nah. They're wounded, they're broken, eh, damaged goods. Back in those days, uh, people who had deformities weren't even welcome in the royal palace. So the truth of the matter is, even if Saul would have survived or that his, his family line would have taken the, 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 the throne, they wouldn't even have let Mephibosheth back in the house. They would have put him out in the garage somewhere because he got crippled. So why was he left alive? I think because no one would consider him to be a threat. Because nobody would consider someone with a physical or mental defect fit for the throne. A lot of times people don't consider some of us who have physical or mental defects or disabilities fit for leadership, fit for, uh, for, 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 for teaching, for, for, for whatever. You fill in the blanks, but we are. What about you? Are any of you walking around feeling like you've been written off? Considered as no count, you know, you're just so despised, so dismissed. Considered so useless, you don't even factor into the equation. You know, it's like when people are going through the wheel, you know, it's like, ah, so and so. Well, what about so? Nah. What about so? Nah. You know, unfortunately, those were the practices of that day, and unfortunately, I'll say, there's still the practices that go on today. This kind of pecking order, you know, who's in and who's out, who's worthy, who's not. 
has even crept into the church. Forgive us, Lord. We find ourselves thinking, let alone saying, you know, or acting upon the, uh, on these thoughts. You know, who's welcome in the church? Who's not welcome in the Lord's house? But what I want you to know today is that God can take our brokenness and use it for his glory. I want you to know today, you might be broken, but you are amazingly broken. Amazingly broken. I say amazingly broken because you're God's amazing child, first of all. So if you're God's amazing child, you have to, if you're broken, you got to be amazingly broken. You got to be broken for purpose. And you got to believe that. So when others are thinking that you're nothing, that you're too broken, that you're too damaged, that you're labeled too this or too that, that you're not enough, that you're unfit to be in the community, that you're not from the right side of the tracks, that you don't come from the right family. When others name us and label us as defects, as derelicts, right? Demons or dead dogs. Mephibosheth said, who am I? That you would even take notice of me. I'm a dead dog. I'm nothing. When others try to break our spirits with their condemnations, break our hearts with their rejections, break our dreams by not fully allowing us to participate, God says, don't despair. Don't despair. I will indeed take your brokenness and I'll bring a blessing out of it, says the Lord. For I, the Lord, have formed this very day, and I have formed you for this day. I formed you to be amazing. Yes, even in your brokenness, God sees you as amazing, amazingly broken. And when God has purpose for you to be in a place, to be in a place of leadership, to be in a place of authority, to write a book, to raise up a business, to mother someone, to father someone, to lead a people, when God appoints it and anoints you to be that person, guess what? That's where you're going to be. And if God says you're supposed to sit at the king's table, that's where you will be. When God has purposed you to be a witness in the earth, when he's purposed you to be an overcomer, purposed you to be set free from addiction, set free, liberated, he's purposed you to be whole. And we don't have to wait on tomorrow. God sees us as amazing right in the midst of our brokenness. For the Lord will decree, and he indeed decrees from his own mouth, I will redeem you for my name's sake. See, it's not our honor that's on the line, but it's God's honor. God intends to honor himself. He intends to glorify himself. It's not dependent on what we do today or what we did yesterday. God will bring honor to himself. He will make you a disciple. He will fill you with grace. He will set you in a community of people who love you. He'll surround you with other broken people so that you and I can be healed together. God will take the foolish things of this world to confound those who are wise. Friends, why did I choose in the midst of an amazing, your amazing sermon series to talk about a man named Mephibosheth? Well, first of all, I didn't do it on my own, but by the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. And I believe God wants us to know today that each of us individually and collectively are some version of Mephibosheth having been dropped in our lives having been broken crippled, damaged we are some version of Mephibosheth we've been running at times in our lives hiding in low debar But even though Mephibosheth was broken, God had not forgotten about him. Mephibosheth lost everything 
as the grandson of a king. But God had plans for him to inherit what was rightfully his. Friends, it might look like today that your future is carved out a little different than you had anticipated, carved out a little different than, than, than what your lineage should say, carved out a little different from what your parents had intended, carved out a little different from what you had intended, but God. But God. God sees your brokenness. And friends, when David's men arrived at, at Mephibosheth's dwelling place, fear undoubtedly filled Mephibosheth's heart. He said, I've been found. Oh my God, I've been hiding here in Lodabar in the backside of the mountain. I didn't expect anybody to find me here. Sometimes we're walking around, you know, feeling like nothing and nobody, feeling like frauds. And then we're in the moment, we feel like, ha, ah, I've been found out. In our woundedness, in our brokenness, we feel like we've been found out crippled since the age of five he says to himself more than likely oh man here I am I got a wife and kid now I've been living down here in a place no pasture but now I'm surely gonna die right because King David has found out about me and he's gonna take my life because he believes I'm a threat to the throne and some of his first words to King David when, it, when Ziba, his men, bring, bring uh, uh, Mephibosheth to, to David, he said, who, who am I, Lord? As he lays prostrate before uh, King David, he said, who am I that you would even take notice of me? I, I'm a dead dog. I, I'm not a threat to you. In other words, he's kind of begging for his life. I'm crippled. But even before David was anointed king, God had a plan for Mephibosheth. And God had a plan for David. God knew that David would become a man after God's own heart. God knew that David wouldn't rule as other kings ruled, right? God knew that David wouldn't fear as other kings fear and, and try, to, try to take the lives of everybody that belonged to that family. In fact, if you continue reading the book of Samuel, you'll find out that some of David's mighty warriors, and they were indeed mighty, but David, he, he, he answered to God, right? And they went out and they, 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 they hunted down anybody they thought was going to be a threat to the throne. And they beat them and they whipped them and cut their heads off and said, here, David, <laughs> I got a head for you. I've knocked out a threat. And David said, what? are you doing did I tell you I was scared did I tell you I was afraid do you not know I am the Lord's anointed what, what, what have you done to this innocent life we don't live in fear as other men live but we live by the love of God and David took his mighty warriors and he put them to death for causing the death of an innocent soul. Oh, David was another kind of king. David would come and precede Jesus, the king of kings. Hallelujah, amen. David knew what God has said through the prophet Samuel that the, that, that the kingship, that the throne would never depart from his house. And he believed it. Friends, what have God said to you about your life? What has the word of God said to you about being a believer? What have the preachers said to you? We said, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing. Do you receive it? Do you hold on to it in the midst of trial and, and controversy? Friends, in only a way that God could orchestrate, <laughs> and God just works this way. He has so knitted David and Jonathan's hearts together in his love for Jonathan to be extended to his son, even a son who could claim the right to the throne but David embraced him as a brother. You see, David knew God, not only as Lord, not only as master or ruler, but he knew him as Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah God, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees afar off and supplies all our needs. 
friends, the Lord is seeing afar off. <laughs> he's already tossed the football, right? And he's just asking us to just run, children. Just keep moving in the direction that the ball is gone, that the word has gone, because when God decrees a thing, it will be so. God said, I have sent my word, and it will perform unto the thing that I've sent it out to do. It will not return unto me void. I am God. I am the Lord who decrees this thing. You see, God didn't see Mephibosheth's brokenness as others did. God saw that Mephibosheth had been amazingly broken as a child to bring forth the glory of God in his adulthood. Now, I don't mean that God caused his brokenness, that God caused him to be crippled, but I am saying that God can and did use it for his glory, and he can and will use any brokenness, any crippledness, any damage, anything for his purpose and his glory. God used it to preserve Mephibosheth for the day that he would, retur that for the day that he would return to the king's table, to the king's palace. To be accepted finally in the king's palace. Tradition said, no, once you're crippled, you can't come back in. But God said, oh, I take the wounded. I take the brokenness. I work through the broken. You see, it's through our brokenness that we even come to the Lord. That we even have the sensibilities to bow our knees to God in prayer and say, Lord, forgive me. For I am broken. I am sinful and I need to be set free. See that God works through that brokenness. And I want you to know that as a child of the most high God, each of us have a rightful inheritance to the kingdom. Each of us are heirs to the throne of grace. Looking at your life right now, what do you see? God has indeed given us eyes to see. He gives us eyes to see through the Holy Scriptures. He gives us eyes to see through the preach word. He gives us eyes to see through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So many times we, we don't see as God sees. We don't see as God wants us to see. So often we see as others see, and then we accept a vision for our lives of what they see in us, in their short-sightedness. A few months back, we erected a cross right here in the sanctuary, and we said, you know what, we're going to take some of that brokenness to the Lord. We're just going to nail it to the cross. We're going to take our too fat, too ugly, not enough stuff, not good enough stuff. We're going to nail it to the cross. We're going to take all that rejection. Would you put that body image up there for me? Not good enough stuff. You know, this is what the body looked like. And in your bulletins, there's that image right there in the insert in your bulletin of the things that we were feeling about ourselves. I'm too late. I, I'm divorced. I got some self-hatred going on. Pastor, I'm feeling anxious about some things. Lord, I feel unwanted. I even feel suicidal. God, I'm suffering here. I'm heartbroken. I'm drinking myself to death. I got some obsessions. I got some secret sins, God. I'm worried about the past. I'm anxious about the future. I feel worthless, God. And the list went on and on and on of brokenness. Brokenness, hearts broken, finances broken, broken relationships, broken self-images, just broken. But this is the revelation that God gave me that we're not so broken because of what other people see or in us or think about us but broken, guilty, and ashamed for what we think of ourselves. And unknowingly that shame creates an image inside of us. And that's how we end up viewing ourselves as individuals, as a community, as a congregation, as a denomination. 
But I believe God wants us to flip that page over. I believe He wants us to see the other side, no longer seeing us in this body, but turn the other, the other image there, but to see the cross of Jesus Christ. To see all of the hurts, the habits, and hang-ups that we struggle with. To see the other side. To see that God can do amazing things with our brokenness. Despite our brokenness. Now friends, don't get me wrong. I know it's not easy. I have felt the pain of rejection just simply being who I am. I've felt the pain of rejection of being a woman. I've felt the pain of rejection of being divorced and remarried. I have felt the pain of rejection simply because of the color of my skin. But I'm here to tell you today that I've lived long enough and I've trusted God long enough to see that the enemy isn't out there. I found that the enemy is right here, right up front and personal with me. You see, I've learned that long after the words have been spoken, that I'm the one that keeps rehearsing them in my head over and over and over. Long after the injury, I'm the one still licking the scab on my wound. And I'm the one that won't let it heal. Many of you, after the addiction, after the abuse, after the adultery, are still unable to forgive yourselves. Long after the guilty verdict, we still remain imprisoned behind the bars of our shame. I want you to hear this, and I hope you'll write it down. Guilt is what others lay upon us. Guilt is what others lay upon us, but shame is what we carry with us. Shame is what we carry with us. Yes, you may have been guilty. You may currently be guilty as charged. You may be a mess that needs fixing. You may be caught up under a spiritual stronghold, but God is not limited by a guilty verdict. God is not limited by a court decision or a sentence. God is not limited by that adulterous affair. He's not limited by that secret sin. He's not limited by the abuse that you experience. He's not limited by addictions. But we can limit God in our shame. So friends, I'm closing here and just be in an attitude of prayer. If you're here today and you're wrestling with self-doubt and self-image, I'm going to ask the worship team to come because we're going to come out of sync. We're going to go right into worship and then we will receive the Lord's offering and the announcements. But we're going to move with the Spirit. If you are here today and you're wrestling with self-image, struggling with spiritual strongholds, that cloud the vision of how God sees you. I invite you to receive the grace of God that's made available to each of us. Made available through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Blood that is and was appropriated for every wrong, for every sin, for every secret and hidden shame. Grace that abounds with love. He desires to enfold you with his grace and his love. God desires to cover you, to protect you, to spread his love over you, to give you beauty for ashes joy for your sorrows and hope for today. Beloved, if you can receive it today, I want you to know that God uses the broken places in our lives as a portal through which He will enter into with His love, with His healing, and His forgiveness. And so wherever it is that you find yourselves laid open and bare, even naked this morning, I say to you, be not ashamed. 
Be not ashamed and be not afraid. Wherever brokenness has left you wounded, God is present to heal. Wherever brokenness has left you crippled and scarred, believe that God will turn it around for his good. Wherever the past continues to rear its ugly head, I want you to know that you can raise up a word against him, against the enemy, and you can pull down every thought and every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I want you to know that your pain is an open place for God's amazing grace, an open space for God to show you how beautifully, beautifully broken you can be in his hands and how his, how your amazing brokenness can be used for his glory. Friends, the altar is open. There are prayer cards in front of you. Feel free to write one out and bring it to the altar. Feel free to come forward for prayer. There are, we have a prayer team that will pray with you, will agree with you in prayer that you are amazing and amazingly broken. I pray this day that each of us may find the freedom to release ourselves from the guilt because there's only one judge, to release ourselves from the shame and to live secure in the knowledge and truth that we are the children of God, that we are accepted in the beloved, that we are amazingly broken, amazingly loved, amazingly set free.
offering and the Lord's tithes. I know you've already prepared yourselves to give. The ushers are coming forth now and are going to make their way throughout the sanctuary. And friends, after you give, if you'll just stand to your feet and just continue to worship the Lord and prepare to receive the benediction. We've gone a little long this morning and there are others waiting in the lobby to attend the next service. All right, I receive that. Come on, stand to your feet, friends, if the, if the ushers have already passed you. Come on and stand to your feet. Come on and dare to lift your hands and give God glory and just giving thanksgiving. Just worship him for who he's made in you. Just worship him for how he's amazingly created you. Just worship him for your brokenness. Just worship him because you're not defined by that, but you are defined by everything that God says that you are. Worship team, you say...